uh, and virtually to, to uh, this uh, presentation. I'm going to tell you about a paper that I've been working on for, for a while. It's gone through several rounds of refereeing uh, uh, and, of course, has been perfected uh, uh, through the process. I'm delighted to, to, to say that this is finally going to come out in the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis. So, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, tell you about it. Um, something that I, when I first started, got into this line of research, and there's a couple of papers involved, and I'll tell you a little bit about both of them. Um, it was one of these things where you suddenly realize that something that you've been teaching for over 40 years is simply wrong. And what we know, what everybody knows is that an American call on a non-dividend paying stock should never be exercised early. And because it shouldn't, it's worth the same as a European call. And that's such a, a valuable uh, property. You can use a Black-Scholes model for both of them, right? So, and students always want to say, well, all right, so I want to get out of uh, uh, the call before, before expiration, shouldn't I exercise it? And the answer was no, and, it, and I always love doing this. Uh, uh, in about two or three steps, starting from put call parity, you can show that you shouldn't exercise it. You should, it, its value as a European option is always greater than intrinsic value because there's time value too. And if you exercise early, you lose the time value. So what you should do is sell it in the market for its fair value. And the fair value, since you don't want to exercise early, is going to be the European call price. Very nice. Students are always amazed. All right. What if there's no options market? You can't sell it. Or you don't like the price in the options market. Well, in that case, we can replicate selling the option by shorting the stock and delta hedging until it expires. So our, 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 in the, the theoretical frictionless world that we live in, uh, at least in the classroom, um, you wouldn't exercise an American call early and therefore it's worth the same as a European call. But in the real world, the market's bid price for an in the money option is very rarely as high as fair value. This is a great surprise. And, and it was a surprise to me when I first saw this and it may well be a surprise to a lot of you guys too that um, these the options become really illiquid and they don't have to be very far in the money and they don't have to be very close to maturity either. It's just you can't trade them anymore. You can't get a decent quote in the market. You can always trade them. You can, there's always gonna be market makers making uh, bids and offers, but the bids end up going down below intrinsic value. And here's an example. There are many, many examples, but this one just happened to be something I was looking at when I wrote the first draft of the paper, so it's still in it now. I was looking at, um, on April 24th, uh, looking at ExxonMobil stock and call options on it. Uh, and the bid price for Exxon at that point, back in the old days, right? was $81. It's about $30 now, 33, something like that. Um, here were two Exxon call options. One, the May 75 uh, was going to mature in 25 days, but more than three weeks. And the June 75 had 53 days to maturity. So a 75 strike call, if the stock is at 81.16, is $6.16 in the money. The best bid across all the options exchanges at that time was 585 for the May contract and 590 for the June contract. All right. So that means that that it was 31 the the May contract was 31 cents below intrinsic value, the best bid you could sell it for in the market. And even a June contract that had you know a month and a half to maturity was still 25 cents too low in the market. And in uh, a paper that I, they're going to hear about more, uh, I wrote with uh, Robert Battaglio and, and uh, Rob Neal, uh, we called this an exercise boundary violation, an EBV. So if you see that acronym in, in these slides, EBV refers to how much the put, excuse me, how much the bid is below intrinsic value. All right. Well, if this is the case, if I got a European option, I got to, and I have to get out, then I have to just suck it up and take the bid. Um, uh, but if it's an American option, I can exercise it. I can always get intrinsic value. 
you're still going to lose the, to the options time value, but you can at least recover intrinsic value, which is better than you can do by selling in the market. Now, I first heard about this situation maybe 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, when Rob Neal called me up and said, uh, you know, Steve, we're working on some uh, options data here. And there's some really weird stuff going on with the bids. Do you have any explanation for that? And I had no idea what he was really talking about, but so I ended up working on a paper with them and I'll show you some of the results from that that show that these, this underpricing is the norm. This happens all the time. This is not something that is rare and unusual in odd illiquid stocks. This is, this is the norm, all right? So what I wanted to show you in this paper, we got three different things to do. One is to document what I'm telling you about the illiquidity of single stock options. I think a lot of us have this idea from working with options where the data is good, you know, options on uh, like the spider or options on, on futures. So uh, those where there's a lot of trading, but single stock options are really quite different. So in that case, when the bid is too low, if the bid's below intrinsic value, you can always exercise the American option and get intrinsic value. If you have to sell in the market, you're gonna get less. All right, so that's the first thing. I wanna show you some, uh, some evidence on that. Then I wanna show you how you can value the, the, the li liquidity value of Americanness um, when the bid can, can get too low. And I'll show you how to, how, um, to create a closed form solution in a similar way that Whaley did for um, exercise of American uh, calls on dividend paying stocks. The, the technology is kind of similar. It's very similar, in fact. All right. And then the third thing I want to do is uh, apply this to some data. Um, I've got options on 24 big stocks that have a lot of, relatively a lot of option trading. And you see that this problem is, is present with them too. And then I can show you how, uh, uh, what, estimate what the value of this uh, uh, Americanist premium is using the, the model and then compare it to the Americanist premium for the dividends on these stocks. So that's where we're going, all right? So what do you do? You know, you're a trader, you're holding, you own some calls and you have to get out. You don't want to hold the expiration. Why do you have to get out? Well, you might want to get out because the thing's gotten so far in the money that you don't think it's going to go any further. So get your money back. Or because you're on a trading desk and the head of the desk comes and says, what are you doing with this, this position that's not getting you anything? Get out. Or, you know, a lot of other things. So we don't have to know why you have to exercise, but like, Lots of options are not held till expiration. Right. So what do you do? Well, one, one thing you can do is to <clears throat> sell at the bid. Get, that's the best, you know, just take what's, what's being out there in the market. If it's American, you can exercise and, and get the intrinsic value, which may well be better, frequently will be better. You can hold on to the option, but try and exit the position synthetically by delta hedging. And we had to do this all the way to expiration. And the fourth possibility, which I know will be near and dear to Neil Pearson's heart, is you post a limit order above, at or above intrinsic value, and you will let the market come to you. All right, so those are all possibilities. Um, in principle, the third strategy is the one that will let you get the actual theoretical value, the European call value, and not just intrinsic value. You can try getting it uh, by posting a limit order as well, but I'm gonna show you in a second that the limit order strategy sounds good, but it does not work in, market, in the markets that are so illiquid as single stock calls. All right. But first, let's think about, so suppose you want to delta hedge it, all right? Well, if you're going to delta hedge a position to get out of it, you've got to sell short the stock. So you've got to borrow the stock and sell it short. You've got to pay the transactions cost involved in doing that. Plus, to the extent that you have to do rebalancing, you're going to have to pay transactions cost for those uh, trades as well. Um, you're going to, you have to earn a riskless interest rate on the short sale proceeds and worry that the stock could go on special and then you're 
it's going to get called away from the short sale is going to get called away from you. Jensen and Pedersen, a really nice paper, JFE 2016, they showed that this alternative, the alternative delta hedging is just really expensive and is easily dominated by early exercise. Uh, now they look only at closing prices and they show that replication costs are frequently high enough that early exercise is rational, all right? Okay, what about the other idea? Uh, can you get intrinsic value or even a Black-Scholes value by posting a limit order? And the answer is, it's not easy. Um, in the course of uh, um, revising this for the JFQA, I put in uh, a couple of appendices and one shows how illiquid these single stock options are. And I'm gonna show you some numbers in a second. Now, it's a surprise kind of because, you know, you sort of think, well, gosh, there's market makers out there, there's bids, there's offers, they don't look too bad. Uh, you know, they're there all the time, they're updated as the market is moving. But the deal risk control for market makers is, is categorically different than for individual option holders because they're they're trading a lot of different options on the same underlying and they're controlling their risk at the portfolio level. So for, from their perspective, from a market maker's perspective, one call is pretty similar to another call. They're highly substitutable. But if I'm, an, if I'm holding a specific option and I want to get out of that position, I got to find somebody to take the other side of that particular option. And in many cases, there'll be little or no trading in that option once it's, once it's in the money. Okay. And even when there is adequate order flow, you know, a stock like, uh, like Apple has a lot of options trading. You can, you can count on the uh, orders coming in, even though there's plenty of options, uh, Apple options that don't trade. Okay. But even when there's adequate order flow from, from the outside, from, you know, you're gonna trade with somebody who's not a market maker, you post a limit order, but that limit rapidly becomes stale as the underlying stock price moves. So if the stock price goes down, your limit, the market's ask price is gonna go down below your limit and now you won't execute no matter what happens in the market. Alternatively, the stock goes, the stock goes up. Now what's happening is the market bid price is coming up still below intrinsic value because the market is, stock price is going up but intrinsic value is going up too. And as time goes along, your static limit is going to be below intrinsic value because intrinsic value has gone up. So now you get hit, if you get hit at that point, you do the trade, you do the trade at the price you originally set, but at that moment, if you can say, okay, never mind, I'm not gonna trade after all, I'm gonna exercise, you'd still do better because you, because the market has moved up, so intrinsic value has gone up, and now your your limit is no longer uh, above intrinsic value. So, doing this trade is hard. That's all. It's not impossible, but it's hard. All right. So here's some results from Metalio, Figluski, and Neil, uh, uh, where we looked at intraday pricing on all single stock call options. Um, at one minute intervals for an entire month. And so, and we excluded ex-dividend days. So there was no rational call exercising. Right. So we had 125,000 contracts, about 670 million observations. And if we look at moneyness breakdown, where here's deep in the money, this option, an option in this range is between 30 and 50% in the money. With one month to maturity, within the last month of maturity, more than 98% of the bids are gonna be below intrinsic value. And 93% if they're still out to four months to maturity. Well, those are way deep in the money. How about these ones? These guys are, are between 10 and 30% in the money still. With a month to go, more than 90% are going to be, the best bid is below intrinsic value and half of them even out to four months are going to be below intrinsic value. And even when you get down to 10% in the money, all right, still there's a lot of ones where the bids are just not going to 
be high enough for you to be able to recover intrinsic value by selling. So, so Steve, let me let me interrupt you for a okay. second because there's a lot of people who have basically the same question in the chat. A lot of people in the chat who have basically the same question or the same point. So what about the strategy, you know, of bidding just above or offering just below your estimate of the fair value, right? So, you know, you've bid more than the fair value or you, you know, you've, you've just crossed the fair value. So maybe an options market maker will be happy to execute against you. Well, that's the, that's what I've just been talking about in the in the, the the last slide. This just doesn't happen. There isn't enough trading, and this slide gives you the gives you further information about whether that might that kind of strategy might work. Let's just take a look at this number. This is these this is the, the results I just get, told you about came from intraday data observed at one minute intervals, and you just don't see uh, bids. This, the, this table uh, is the 24 stocks that I'm gonna be looking at later in the, in the paper. Uh, these are big stocks. So the, the, the Battaglio et al. Uh, paper looked at all of them. So there's about 3000 different uh, op optional stocks, many of which hardly do any trading at all. But these ones are, are actively traded. And still, two, within the last two weeks, if the option is le five to 15% in the money, that's not very far in the money, right? For a two week option. 70, more than 75% of the time, the, days, the bids are gonna be below intrinsic value. And when that happens, only 40% of subsequent days will it be any as much trading as five contracts. No, there's nobody's trading these things. You can sit there posting your limit order, but nobody's going to come and trade against you. That's the that's the 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 uh, remarkable degree of illiquidity in these markets. Right? Even even we look at something like uh, like Apple. All right, these are the most active ones still. 90% of the days for it, once it gets fairly deep in the money, at least three quarters of the time, the bid is gonna to be too low. And a lot of the days that come afterwards, you can't even trade five contracts. So, and there's, I do more analysis in this appendix, but I don't really want to, to, to spend the whole time talking about this. I'd be glad to talk about it uh, later, but I think that it's just a surprise at how illiquid these things are. So let me go on. I've got the, um, the literature in this area. Um, people have looked at early call exercise and mostly from the perspective of the idea that it's irrational. All right. um, a couple of papers say it might be rational. The Jensen and Pedersen paper that I mentioned, the one that I just, uh, with Battaglia O'Neill that I just mentioned, and also uh, Cow, Etterington, and Yadav have uh, done a similar thing looking at uh, put options. Uh -huh. There's a lot of work on illiquidity and options and bid ask spreads, but it's hard to get a value for, there's some great papers here, uh, um, but it's hard to get a value, to put a dollar value on uh, the, the price of illiquidity. A couple of papers have tried to with relatively limited degree of success, I think. And the, the last thing that I, I wanna to point to is the, the Whaley paper back in 1981 that basically developed the, the, the technology for what I'm about to do. Right. Okay, so if the idea is that we ought to exercise the American option, then you're gonna get the stock. So then what happens when you have to liquidate the stock is relevant. So we looked at transactions costs. Can that explain why people don't do this? All right. Well, <clears throat> These, these uh, prices, uh, uh, commission rates are from a couple of years ago. They quite are quite likely are lower today. Um, Interactive Brokers is one of the biggest online brokers. 70 cents per option contract, no charge for exercise, and trading the stock is half a penny per share. Plus, if it's a big trade, then another couple bucks. All right. What this amounts to is about 
72 cents to lick, to exercise one option contract. Right. E-Trade, it's a little bit more, $11.90 to do this trade, but still it's way better than um, the, the, the value of the, the low, um, uh, low bids. And the other thing is that <clears throat> Whether you exercise a week before maturity or you exercise your in the money option when it comes to expiration, you still are gonna to have to sell the stock. So, so exercising early doesn't impose extra transactions costs upon, upon an exercise. Right. Okay, um, so I wanna start now developing the model for how you can value the difference between European option and American exercise. All right. So if there are any further questions about uh, the stuff I just showed you, better have it now. And if, if not, I would like to go on. Well, well, my observation, one observation, I mean, you know, there, there, it wasn't really my question. It was my attempt to summary a widespread question, mm -hmm. but my reaction to your answer is that you know what you'd really like to see is conditional on i post an aggressive a conditional on a public customer posts an aggressive limit order then what's the probability that that aggressive limit order gets executed i think that's the, and and so you know you don't actually you don't actually see many aggressive limit orders because there aren't that many public customers who want to trade, right? Li, li, you know the in the money options. But I, I'm not sure that your data analysis actually answers this question of you know conditional on posting an aggressive limit order. What's the probability of exercise? Well, the, um, there's another piece of analysis that uh, that gets a little bit towards that uh, in uh, uh, Appendix Three. Um, but um, I don't want to. I, I, I don't want to go into it in great detail. But the basic issue is this: I put an. Uh, I put a. Let's say. The option is twenty dollars in the money. The best bid out there is nineteen, so I put in a, a, a sell order at twenty. All right. Well, there's no reason that that a market maker who's bidding nineteen is going to be impressed by my my. Uh, uh, offer at 20. So I'm going to wait until an order comes in. Well, while I'm waiting, the market's moving. How long do I have to wait before the, uh, uh, you know, how long do I have to wait before I'm going to have to really start managing, uh, repricing my limit? And the answer is, <clears throat> it depends. For, for the less liquid options, the spreads are so wide, you can leave your your order in there for a long time, but days may go by before people actually reach it. Options with narrower spreads and more volatility, you have to be pretty careful to try not to get picked off as the market moves. Right? So that there's, there's more in appendix three if you want to see that, but that's kind of what I'd like to say about it. Okay, so before you go on, Dimitri had a question that I, that I think is related to what you're about to talk about. I'm not okay. sure, but I think it is. So the question is, um, also, the paper is pricing an option from the perspective of an investor who has an existing option position and wants to sell. Yeah. Will the fair option price differ for an investor who wants to sell an option to establish a new position? If so, how to reconcile these two prices? Well, from my what I'm trying to do is to value the the right to exercise early. If I'm trying to enter into the market to take a, a new position, a short position, if, if that's if that was the issue, uh, if if I own an option and I'm trying to sell it, that's one thing. If I'm trying to open a position, then I would have a different point of view. Well, if I'm opening a position, there is no way in the world I'm going to open a position by selling before below intrinsic value. So I kind of think that that side of the market doesn't really it, it doesn't really affect what I'm trying to get at right here. Come back to me later afterwards, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Well, it might be a little, maybe I'll maybe maybe Dimitri can ask you after you're finished. Yeah. 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 
Okay, so I'm going to put this into basically a Black Scholes kind of a framework where the if you if you the price in the options market is going to be the Black Scholes value with a bid S spread around it, and the bid is going to be lower by an amount B. Right. You can exercise an American call and get intrinsic value. Right. Right. So putting this into the Black Scholes framework, I'm going to assume the standard log normal diffusion for stock prices. Options pay off, as we know options do, and maximum of intrinsic value is zero at maturity. And I have discount function with a constant, uh, constant riskless rate. Second big assumption here is investors have constant relative risk aversion. Right. So what that allows me to do is to take the Black-Scholes value as a benchmark. A European option holder liquidating early is going to get the Black-Scholes value minus B. And B, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about this as ha the half spread, and I may call it the half spread, but really it's just whatever the discount below Black Shoals is uh, where the, to find the bid. Nice thing about the Black, about constant relative risk aversion and log normal diffusions is that Brennan has proved that the option payoff, this option payoff, just take it as an asset without any concern of, of what the underlying stock might be, without any concern about option replication or hedging or any of that sort of thing, just taking that payoff as an asset. Brennan shows that the assumptions of constant relative risk aversion and log normal diffusions, the value to the investor is the Black-Scholes value. So, and this comes from maximizing expected utility. It doesn't require re replication or hedging, doesn't even require options to exist, but that payoff is worth the Black-Scholes value under these assumptions. All right, so I find that very useful as a benchmark and it can sidestep a whole lot of issues of like, well, in a market, what about, uh, what about trading by people who are more risk averse or something like that? And the final thing I would say is that a difference in differences argument, since I'm going to be looking at the American value with this early Ill illiquidity penalty relative to the Black Shoals without, you know, in a frictionless world versus the European call relative to Black Shoals, that difference in differences might give me the right difference between the American and European call under all kinds of contexts. So I, I, I like that uh, assumption as well. All right. Okay, so there's a possibility you might want to exercise or have to get out at any date between now and expiration day. And so there's a liquidation function um, which I'm going to assume is a, a constant probability of, of liquidation in the theoretical model, and then I'm going to try and estimate it from data uh, when we get to the empirical part. And the idea is, and so I, the one thing I need to assume is that this liquidation function is independent of what happens to stock price. And that's kind of a big assumption. Um, if you want to say they're correlated, like you're more likely to exercise if the options deep in the money, um, then uh, well, we'd have to put covariances into the model, which I have not done. Right. So the European option is going to be worth, well, we look out over time, summing over all dates on which it might be exercised, the probability is going to get exercised on, on that date times the Black-Scholes value, which is the benchmark, minus the discount. That's what you get if you have a Euro if you exercise European option early, discounted using this discount function, and there's a chance you'd hold it to maturity, and so there's a payoff at maturity as well. <clears throat> European option is exactly the same, or, excuse me, the American option is exactly the same thing, except instead of getting the Black Scholes value, you have the max of the Black Scholes value minus B or intrinsic value. Right. Well, given the way the Black-Scholes equation works, there will be the, what you lose, the difference between the Black-Scholes value and intrinsic value <clears throat> is the time value. The time value gets is smaller and smaller, the deeper the option is in the money. So there's going to be a stock price S star, which you'll see in one second. Um, if the stock at, on the day that you're trying to decide whether to exercise or to sell, if that stock price is 
above this value S star, you want to exercise. If it's below S star, you want to sell. All right, and here's kind of a picture that shows this. That's intrinsic value. The curve is call value. If you have to sell in the market and give up B, then there will be a price here where the intrinsic value and the call value minus B are the same. Right. And that's this is star in with the formula with, excuse me, with the values I put in and making this uh, picture, S star comes on a 90 strike call ends up being $95.86. All right, here's the, here's the way you can replicate the payoff on the American call. The American call, you're going to get this blue curve, European value minus, um, minus B, up to S star, but S star you want to exercise and then you move out along this higher curve. Right. To replicate that payoff for, a, for date little t, I can put together a portfolio that consists of a European call with strike price of X, right, and maturity T. So this is if you if you're not going to exercise, right, or if you're going to this is what a European call. Uh, if you hold to maturity, that's where you're going to get paid off. Right. A second European call with a strike at this S star value. The third piece is a compound call, a call on a call which you write with the strike price equal to S star minus X plus B, which as you'll see in a second is just enough that if you want to exercise, this option is going to get exercise and it's going to cause the option number one to be taken out of your portfolio and replaced just by the strike price. And the fourth piece is a fixed payment of B, all right? Here's a table, kind of table that we're used to, to drawing different contingencies. If S star, if, if S star is bigger than the stock price when you want to um, liquidate, then you want to sell in the, sell in the market, All right? If S star is less than the stock price, then you want to exercise, all right? Well, first consider if you're gonna sell in the market, I've got the European call and I got to pay B. So, and this option with a strike price of S star is going to be out of the money. And this option is also going to be out of the money because, because option number one will be less worth less than S star minus X plus B. All right, so those two things come out to be zero. The payoff, if you don't want to exercise Black-Scholes value minus B, which is what, what you'd get. On this, pay, on this side, if the stock price is high, remember at this point, this point right here is S star minus X plus B. And at any higher stock price, the option is worth more. You, you'd exercise any lower price, stock price, you wouldn't exercise. All right. So at a high stock price, the call on the call is going to get exercised. The call that you uh, are holding, number one, disappears. The second call is also going to be in the money, and you're going to get a payoff of S minus S star. The strike from the other one is S star minus X, so the two S stars cancel out. I've got S minus T plus B, a payoff of B on the, on the bond leaves the, the intrinsic value. So this combination of things, this set of Black-Scholes options and the option on the option, which we can price today at time zero, gives us the same payoff as we would get by optimally exercise the American call at date T. All right, and I had a bunch of pictures, which I, I, I love this picture, spent so much time putting together, but I'm just gonna skip it because I'm, I'm running low on time. Um, here are the formulas for those uh, different pieces, uh, which you should look pretty familiar to you. Now, that was to replicate on one single date little t, but we have all the possible dates little t, and so now we have to look at the probabilities of, uh, uh, of exercise on each of those dates and have 
a replicating portfolio times a probability for each of those dates. To do this easily, in the, in the model that I'm showing you right now, I just assumed a constant rate of decay. So this is like uh, um, default of a, a, in a credit model, credit risk model. All right. So there's a rate of liquidation, lambda, and just for illustration, what I'm gonna show you right now, <clears throat> lambda, is uh, um, I assume lambda is going to be such that <clears throat> you got a 75% chance of liquidating before maturity, a 25% chance that you hold to maturity. And then later on, I'm going to estimate this from the data. So this is the same formula Oops, looked at before, only with these uh, probabilities replaced by the uh, survival uh, function that I've assumed. And now putting everything into the model, this is what the American liquidity premium looks like as a function of time to maturity. And I've got four different strikes and two different levels of, of volatility here. So the first one, the tallest, the, the highest black line is the value as a function of time to maturity. Here we got 10 days to maturity. It says that, that the early exercise value of Americanness is worth about 10 cents on this day, or excuse me, about 71 cents on this day. That's for the 80 strike option. A 90 strike option, about the same. This is the blue one, right? And even an at the money option or an out of the money option have value for this early exercise American this option. It's interesting that the out of the money one, this one is a, a 105 strike call when the stock's at 100. All right. Still, with a month to go, the possibility that the stock might go, the option might go in the money and, and then be subject to this uh, um, low bid problem. The ability to get rid of, to, to avoid that by having an American call is worth, well, it looks like it's about four to five cents. A month ahead of time. Right. The dotted ones uh, refer to high volatility uh, uh, contracts where volatility is not 75%. The solid ones were 25%. These are 75%. And you see they have basically the same kind of shape. Interestingly, the out of the money one is becomes more valuable the higher the volatility. Oops, sorry. More valuable, the higher the volatility because it increases the chance that it's going to go deep in the money and you're going to have to pay. Okay, um, this is uh, now I want to now I want to oh, well, let me let me let me finish with the, the theory and then I want to go to the data um, in real world. Uh, assuming a constant um, discount is inappropriate when we think about well, it's, we're going to apply the same discount to in the money out of the money options. right? In reality, we expect that the quoted spreads widen out for options that get in the money. So I've been fit this function to actual data. If this is the way the bid ask spread behaves, so there's a minimum bid B0, and as the stock goes up higher than some value K, then there's a break point and the, and the spreads begin to widen out. Normally you might expect K to be close to at the money, but I don't impose that as a, as a constraint. Uh, and it turns out that as you'll see, it comes out pretty close to being at the money. All right. Well, here's a slightly improved or a modified uh, replication portfolio. The only difference is that you have to have a little bit more of the call that goes into the money when you're above S star and you have to add a, an option here um, to cover the fact that the, that the um, discount that you're going to suffer de <clears throat> depends on the stock price. And this, this, the, this is a table that shows how everything works out again, but I'm going to jump over that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, any, uh, any quick questions for... 
Hearing none, I am Actually, no, I, I was slow. I had to unmute myself, but you're actually right. There's no outstanding question in the chat right now. Excellent, good, thanks. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna fit that Brit S spread model to closing prices for traded options on 24 major stocks and compute the theoretical value of the early exercise Ill illiquidity based value for early exercise and then compare that to uh, the value of Americanness to get the dividends on those stocks. All right, so I took two years of data, 2016 and 17, 24 stocks, which I chose from, I got data on the total amount of trading volume uh, on all tradable options. There were like 4,500 of them in the, in the sample and sorted by trading volume over these two years and out of the top 500. So we're talking about the top 10% in terms of liquidity in the options market. I picked 24 stocks that kind of span the range from Apple, the third most actively traded, the most actively traded are like, is like the spider, you know, the ETF. And so I've got eight in the top about 50 I've got eight in the next range where trading volume was between about 10 million contracts and about 5 million contracts during this time period. And the less active ones, over a million, but down to GlaxoSmithKline, it was number 473 on my list. But you see, they're all you know, well-known companies and, and highly among options, among the most liquid. Um, converted everything to a common base of uh, stock price of 100, got dividends and dividend dates from CompuStat, the riskless rate is three month LIBOR, and for volatilities, I took the average implied vols from short money, short maturity at the money contracts on those stocks. Right. Are, these are constraints that I applied. I, I, I don't want to go through all of them, but just a couple. Maturity range from three days to 65 days. The average in the data was 30, uh, 34 days. Exercise price uh, from 50% in the money to 50% out of the money with the average of being right about at the money. I require minimum open interest of 50 contracts. So we're not looking at contracts that are just being priced by market makers. Um, and implied vol, the median, or the, excuse me, the average was about 26%. All right, this is a fairly low vol period. Right? This is what these, these bid ask spreads look like. This, this is all the stocks in the sample. <clears throat> this is about the, the eight most active names, the second, eight second most active and the eight least active. I call them less active because they're still in the top 10%, right? And you see, there's a huge range of uh, uh, spreads. But that broken line idea doesn't seem to be doing too much injustice to the data. And appendix one, appendix A in the paper shows how you can put in more kinks if you want with the same kind of strategy. So you can make it more curved if you want. All right. um, <clears throat> the, the spreads were quite um, skewed. So the most active uh, ones, uh, most active stocks have the narrowest spreads. The median in the whole data was 14 cents, but the 75th percentile was 43 cents. And when we look at the less active ones, the median is uh, 50 cents and the, and the 75th percentile is close to a dollar. This part is interesting to see. These are the number of observations that I have in the sample and Oh, wait. Um, excuse, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I have 200, about 210,000 uh, observations of sample, of which 30, more than 30,000 of them had low bids. And this includes at the money, out of the money options, everything. Still, 30,000 of these guys had, had low bids. <clears throat> um, this, the model is fitted, minimum spreads, well, for the less active ones, about 40 cents. They're widening out fairly close to the money. R-squareds aren't too bad. Here you can see you know, what the data looks like. Right? 
Now, it's a real issue as to how many of, of these actual contracts are going to be held to maturity and how many of them are going to get liquidated early, right? Because if, the, if everybody's going to hold to maturity, the right to liquidate early isn't worth anything. If everybody's going to liquidate early, then it's worth a lot. And so the question is, well, how many? And this was an issue that the referee on the paper pushed me on heavily. So I came up with several different ways of estimating this. Um, one is simply by looking at how much um, options, open interest decays as you get close to maturity. You could say, well, if there's 100 contracts outstanding 10 days from maturity and there's 30 contracts at the end, there must have been 70 of them that got liquidated early. Okay, there's a, a limit there that you can't, you can only look at it when, when open interest is going down. It doesn't tell you what to do when the open interest is going up. And the second problem is that, well, yeah, maybe there's 70 contracts that had to be liquidated, but the actual trading volume was 300 contracts during this time period. So there was a lot of other liquidation that was going on too. So the second idea was to, to try and modify the probability of early exercise by um, taking account of the trading volume and two other ways of handling this that allow you to look at the whole span with heroic assumptions, I'll have to admit. And one is to say, okay, all of the, all the open interest right now is gonna be liquidated by as trading occurs first in, first out. So the oldest contracts are gonna get liquidated first and then we're gonna see how long people on average held contracts. The second way is LIFO, uh, is FIFO, first in, first out. It's me last in, first out. So the most recent contracts get liquidated first and longer old ones get to last longer and longer and longer, right? So in the end, I got four different values of this uh, uh, early exercise um, intensity parameter lambda. And so I took the average. And when you do, here's basically the results. And I think I have time to look at this. So an option that with a strike of 80, so that's option, that option is $20, 20 points in the money. Right. Across the whole population of stocks with one week to maturity, the right to exercise between now and expiration is worth 16 cents. A month to maturity is worth 22 cents. For the less active stocks, you can see that it can be worth quite a bit, half a dollar for a two week option. Those ones are way deep in the money. This one, the 90 strikes, they're only 10% in the money. 95 strikes, they're only 5% in the money. And yet we're seeing that these early exercise premia are non-negligible. So jumping ahead, I, you know, I could spend more time on that, but I would really like to jump ahead to talk about how this compares to dividends. So for each stock, I want to show you how I did this. For each stock, let's say Apple, Apple's going to pay a dividend on February 2nd. So I back up two weeks and say, okay, two weeks before that, I have an option that will mature two weeks after. In other words, a dividend happens halfway through the option's life. How much is the value of American exercise to get the dividend versus how, if there weren't any dividend, how much would the value of early exercise to over the next month be? And I do that for two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks uh, holding periods. All right. And so this is what we're getting. Apple has a big dividend. Average dividend is a little, almost 50 cents. And the early exercise value to get that two weeks ahead of time is almost the whole thing. Very little liquidity value. Same even further out, very little liquidity value for Apple. Apple is so active though. But still among the more act most active stocks, we have AT&T. It has a huge dividend, but also the liquidity value of being able to exercise an AT&T option early is worth about 30 cents. I missed two weeks of maturity, over 40 cents for a month's maturity. And you can go down this list and see, well, uh, for the medium active ones, these are substantial numbers. For the less active ones, these are even more substantial numbers. 
And these are for options that are 10% in the money. To give you a, a point of comparison, here are ones that are 20 points in the money. So these are 80 strike ones. And when we get to look at some of these numbers, the liquidity values get to be pretty big. And rather than, than uh, have you sitting there straining your eyes looking at all of these things, these ones, the yellow ones, the liquidity, the theoretical value of uh, liquidity based value of Americanness is bigger than the theoretical value of Americanness to get the dividend in all of these cases that are in yellow. Now, some of them, the stock doesn't pay a dividend. You know, quite a few of these stocks don't pay a dividend. How about, how about Dish Networks, right? No dividend, but, oops, no dividend, but with two weeks to maturity, the ability to, to avoid the low bid on that stock is worth 64 cents, 85 cents if it's four weeks to maturity. So in conclusion, Real world option markets are not perfectly liquid. Unlike the perfect markets of our theory, the best bid in the market for an in the money option with less than a few months, a few months to maturity is below intrinsic value a lot of the time. When that happens, an American call holder can liquidate prior to expiration and get intrinsic value. And that's generally better than selling it in the market. Nearly always gonna be better if as much in the money. And we can value the right to exercise the American call and get intrinsic value with standard Black-Scholes assumptions with one change. And I would go further and say, well, the difference in these two Black-Scholes based values it amounts to a difference in differences approach that I think that that difference could be a pretty good estimate of the difference in value under other contexts, in particular in the real world. So conclusion, an American call is worth more than a European call by an amount that's of similar magnitude and can often be bigger than the theoretically correct early exercise value of an American call to get a dividend. So as one always must end up, clearly more research is needed. There's several major questions that remain. Why are the bids so low? Now, this is a great question, and I have a couple of theories about this, but, but it doesn't matter to the option holder. He doesn't have to know why, they, why he can't get a decent bid. As long as there isn't a decent bid, he'd rather exercise. Second big question, and this is one, uh, if anybody is looking for a good research topic, you know, I recommend this one. Do investors incorporate an appropriate liquidity value for American in pricing options? I showed you how much it should be worth, but I didn't show you that that's how they're actually being priced for those 24 stocks. And the last question is one that bothers me a great deal. Why do finance professors persist in telling our students an American call on a non-dividend paying stock should never be exercised early? When plainly, when you look at the actual market, it should be, all right. So, Thanks very much. I'd be glad to uh, take any questions that anybody's got at this point. So now, now for everyone, our policy is that um, you're allowed to, you're welcome to unmute yourself and use the microphone and shout your questions out. I'll just start off with one su suggestion from Dimitri, which is that it would be interesting to, you know, test the theory on the cases where there are both American and European options on the same underlying. For example, the OEX versus the XEO, which are both on the S&P 100 index. So I don't. That's not. That's more of a suggestion or an observation rather than well, a question. Is, but you're you're welcome to respond if you'd like to. Uh, I'll respond with the question, which is that. I'm not familiar with single stock options that trade in both European and American forms simultaneously. The one, uh, the one case that I am familiar is the one you just mentioned, Neil, which is the OEX and the XEO um, index options. 
index options are inherently different because you exercise for cash and only at the end of the day. As an option where there's actual delivery of stock, you can exercise any time during the day and get the stock and sell it immediately. So you can exercise against intraday prices, which you cannot do with an index option. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, that um, uh, Edrington, Kao, Edrington, and Yadav have a really nice paper in which they look at exactly this issue. They look at uh, XEO versus OEX options, and they conclude that it's the transactions costs that account for the difference between uh, the values of those two kinds of options. So to, to an extent, maybe this, this uh, uh, has already been done. Now, I, I, I've been, I'm in contact with Yadav, and I've been encouraging him to publish that paper, and he's kind of, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, he doesn't get, it's a sad thing where you don't get rewarded for putting a paper in anything except one of the top three journals, so why bother writing it? I mean, I, I, I disapprove of that line of thinking, particularly since it's damned hard to get derivative stuff into those top journals. All right. So, so Dimitri kind of has a follow-up question, which is not really about your paper, but you've been around long enough, you might know the answer. So American options are complicated and annoying. So why do the exchanges trade American options rather than European options? Do you know the Do you know the reason, or it's it's actually even before your time? But you, do you know the reason? You know, I don't. I don't know the reason, but I would have a hypothesis that options were traded a long time before they started being traded on exchanges, and it may be that when the exchange started trading, they just thought, well, we should just start trading the kind of options that everybody's familiar with. That's a hypothesis. I don't know if that's true. But also, you know, when you think about it, the, what I just showed you, by golly, if I had a choice of a European version or an American version, and I've got a couple of months before maturity, I'd really like to be able to get out of that contract before holding, without having to hold it till expiration. So it may be that the market demands the European, uh, excuse me, the American um, exercise. Okay. Thanks. Oh, so anyway, for everyone, I'll repeat my offer. Anyone who has a question is welcome to unmute him or herself and and shout it out. Or you can tell Steve he's great or that he's wrong. Yeah, I'm not hearing that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so so let, I have one other question is this that's that's bothering me, right? Or I was thinking about. So you do all of this analysis from the perspective of an investor who holds or might hold an American call. Yeah. So maybe I overlooked it or misunderstood, right? But it didn't seem like there was market clearing, right? So why should I think this is the equilibrium price? Um, or does the, you know, does the options market make, right? Why, why, why should I, why is this the why is this the market price or is it not the market price? When you say it, which, which the value you, you compute, the the market price for an American call. Taking yes, it. you do all this perspective from the all this analysis from the perspective of the investor who holds the option. Yeah. So I, that's a, that, that's a, a a good question. I think I've got two answers for it. Uh, one is that the, I'm looking at deviations from the theoretical Black-Scholes value. So both the European option in the real world and the American option in the real world should have a discount based on the illiquidity penalty of, of uh, liquidating early. Right? And the Black-Scholes value, you know, one could say, well, what's the market like for these things? Are they going to trade? Uh, uh, how would they trade? What about risk aversion and so forth? But, but by putting it, the theoretical model in the, this context of constant relative risk aversion and log normal diffusions, I can pick out the Black-Scholes value as a benchmark without referring to any trading in the market at all. all right? So what I want to argue is that the difference in the theoretical world between a frictionless Black-Scholes option and, and a European option 
where you you have to give up B, B to liquidate early. The difference between that and the American option in the theoretical world, I would argue, because of the difference in differences kind of approach, is probably a pretty good estimate of the difference in our world. And so that's one answer. And the second answer is what I'm doing is not fundamentally different from what Whaley did in putting de deriving a European, excuse me, deriving a theoretical value for the American call to get the dividend. It's the same kind of thing. You put, put everything into the Black-Scholes framework with one difference. So that, so, so those are my, those, those, those are my two answers. It's a good question. It's, it's a question, one of the qu question that the, that the referee of the paper beat on mercilessly. Right? It wasn't you, was it, Neil? It was not me. No, no, it was, mu it was much <laughs> too nice to be. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, there's a kernel of truth to that accusation, you know, but I'm, I'm trying to behave better in my old age. Well, it's kind of funny, you know, the, the, the referee in three different reports emphasized over and over again how much he really liked the, or he or she really liked the line of reasoning, how important it was to do this, how, how research on this topic definitely, def I'm, the word definitely is in the report a couple of times, definitely deserves space in a top journal, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, the thing you're doing is a really, really, uh, it's full of holes and all kinds of horrible things. So why don't you fix it, right? So I finally succeeded in wearing him down to the point where I guess he's decided I fixed it enough. All right, so I, I won't ask any more questions. I feel like I'm dominating the question and answer period too much. So I'll give anyone else a last chance to, last chance to ask a question, make I mean, a comment, whatever. I mean, if I didn't exceed the limit on the questions, I think the two key frictions here is uh, uh, investors have to sell. And the second one is option market makers are not fully competitive. Yeah. So I wonder what your results can maybe like not only tell us about option pricing, but those kind of economic questions about uh, how competitive liquidity providers are and, and how eager investors are to get out of their positions, perhaps. Well, I tried to get some <clears throat> idea of how eager people are to get out of their positions. And it, it, that turns out, I mean, I encourage you to take a look at Appendix 3, but it turns out to be a really tough kind of a um, no, Appendix 2, me, Appendix B. It turns out to be, you know, tough to, to, to use the available data, at least the available is readily, the data is readily available on trading volume and open interest to get an idea of this. I had to make heroic assumptions and jump through a bunch of hoops. Um, what was it? There was a second part of your paper, uh, question that uh, I drifted out of my brain, mind now. I mean, market makers are not perfect. Well, yeah, why do market makers not bid better? <clears throat> Great question. Um, they are trading in illiquid contracts. If they buy one below intrinsic value, they can exercise it immediately and, and make a profit. And maybe that's just enough to make it worth the annoyance of having to deal with these illiquid things and and and, uh, and make markets in them. And nobody's trading them anymore. Um, so, but I don't know. I don't know what the equilibrium uh, um, undervaluation should be. But I think it's a great question, you know, and if, if we had data, I see Potashman has got his uh, name uh, here. He's a guy who's got data on what uh, uh, what the market makers did. I wonder if that that kind of data uh, data is available, more available than is readily can be seen. Uh, yeah, you we can't hear you. Uh, which, which data in particular? The market makers. Yeah. Uh, so well, do you have any insight? On, on the market makers exercising. I think I had data on everyone else other than the market makers. Well, yeah, uh, the, the paper you did with Carliano and, and Peterson, I thought was fantastic. I love that paper. Thank and you. you. You used data that was not available to me, for example. Yeah, so the data we had there is we had the end of day 
uh, open interest by the three OCC classifications, um, uh, public customer, uh, from proprietary trader, we actually only had on the two, but since there's only three, you know, and they add up to zero, you can kind of infer the other one. Yeah. Yeah. But what would you do with that in this context to like, I'm not sure that directly would tell you how easily or how, how eager people were to get out of positions. Well, you had the um, uh, market maker positions broken down by contract. And is that is that data readily available? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, I thought and, they uh, had broken down a, across the whole population of options. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, I mean, we could talk about this offline if it would somehow be useful to you. Uh, that data was from 1990 till 2001. 2001. Right. Two thousand one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's it's kind of approaching twenty years old. But I, I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Well, uh, yeah, okay. I, mean, I was I was thinking more that you were familiar with with what market maker more familiar with what market makers might be doing and have some insight into. You know, <clears throat> when when I was doing this paper with um, uh, Vitalio and Neil, we we talked to market makers in Chicago and asked them about this, and they didn't have any story. They didn't. They, they couldn't explain why the bids were so low. I mean, basically, it's, these things are illiquid. Nobody wants them. So, Bjorn, you wanted to uh, jump in, uh, or? You know, the reason why the bids are low in a li liquid market is the fact that you don't have to bid a lot, right? It's wishful thinking. Mm. You put a bid in at, at a low price, hoping somebody would come along and, and, and give, it, give it to you at a low price. It's just opportunistic behavior. And as long as, the, by definition, there's no competition, that's what people are going to do. I do it all the time. Makes but is there competition among market makers? If yeah. someone's putting in a price two dollars too low, why does Tony shade it at one fifty? Competition among li liquidity providers, people that post limit orders. Hmm. Hmm. So the the real question is, you know, if you can find asking prices that are in some way violating the arbitrage bounds. It's not no. the bid. I mean, the bid represents opportunistic, wishful thinking, right? Right. I'll put a low bid in and hope that I get it. But if I can actually use a market order to place place a trade and buy an undervalued option and then turn around and, and basically uh, execute it um, or hold it to maturity, you know, that's that's a different story. So I'm not surprised that you're gonna find bids that are low. Well, it, it was a surprise to me how prevalent this is. I didn't realize that this is, ha this is happening virtually every, every call option that gets even a little bit in the money. Uh, and, and, and index options as well. I have another comment on this, and this just relates to the question of whether or not you can come up with an experiment. So people mention these other options. I think on SPY, you have basically the S&P equivalent of an American option, right? They're struck on SPY. SPY pays discrete dividend, but you know it's, 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 it's essentially equivalent. So the, we would expect to see that the dividends, uh, uh, what, what I didn't get there, and I thought you were gonna tell me that there was a way to look at the difference between European and American options. That's what I'm, that's what I'm implying. How, 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 you have to do it, you have to do it over the course of, of uh, uh, for options on SPY that have maturities that do not overlap with the dividend payment. Right. So, okay. so, but you can't you can't observe them simultaneously. What do you mean? 
I mean, it, 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 the SPY that's going to mature in December is going to pay a dividend on uh, at expiration in December on expiration of December futures. But so if I look at a November SPY option, then there's no dividend. If I look at a December SPY option, there would be a dividend, mm -hmm. but those are different options. No, that's what I'm saying. You gotta, if you want a laboratory to kind of compare the, the differences, you can compare SPX options to SPY options when SPY does not pay dividend. Of course, there's some other. Oh, issues. You're, I just say, I see you're saying you're suggesting SPX versus SPY. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, okay, good. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I think that's a good suggestion. I mean, the problem is the tax treatment. So SPX gets a favorable tax treatment versus SPY is always short term gains. This is mm. why people trade SPX versus SPY. Mm. SP, SPX mm. is 60 40, and SPY, you have to pay more taxes. That's an interesting problem, too. I don't understand that. I mean, if you do this in the short term trades, you're always going to pay. For SPX, you're paying 60% long term, 40% short term because these are uh, these are essentially like future related options. While SPY are treated like equity options, so unless you want to have problem with IRS, you have to pay uh, taxes as if these are short 100% short term gains. I mean, uh, this matters for retail investors. I'm not sure about institutions. No, but I, I, I think I'm agreeing with you that, that it's 60-40 on an SPX option, no matter how long you hold it. And SPY options, either going to be short-term or long-term, but never 60-40. Steve, you're talking to guys who want to who trade short, who want to who wanna trade very short-term options. So it's never going to be long-term for Dimitri and Bjorn. OK. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. yeah. On that note, we can continue talking. Uh, everyone will 